There may be only minutes, seconds left of someone's life. Why waste time? Hello fellow aviators, welcome to JPL Aviation, where leadership and aviation take off. Today we're going to be going through my multi-engine check ride, the full details of what happened, just like I did from my instrument, just like I did from my commercial. So if you guys enjoyed those or haven't seen those yet, go ahead and go check those out. Uh, so let's get right on into it of my check ride with Taylor DeLay at John Wayne. So, first things first, I'll start with the intro. I had a commercial multi-engine initial check ride on March 11th, 2021. It was scheduled, but due to aircraft problems and weather in between, it got pushed back three days. I did my training out of John Wayne Airport in a Diamond DA-42 with Horton Aviation, a local flight school on the field. For anyone who's been in the predicament of a delayed check ride, there are many emotions that are associated with it. You may be feeling anxiety and stress about feeling prepared than not being able to perform when at your peak ability. This was a main concern of mine as having not flown in four days on the day of my check ride was a bit unnerving. It was unnerving because when you're flying a whole new aircraft over the course of five lessons and are expected to be able to be ready for a check ride the next week, it's a lot to accomplish cognitively when you take a break from flying before your check ride. The multi-engine ride in general is a check ride that is often offered a fast-tracked program because it can be very expensive and has a relatively lower number of tasks that must be accomplished if going for a commercial multi-engine add-on, in which most people are. The main topics you'll learn about will be VMC, the specific aircraft systems on the aircraft you're going to fly, and certain performance aspects of what a multi-engine encompasses, such as the accelerate stop and accelerate go distances. Part 23 certification on what the de definition of VMC is, is very important if you haven't checked it out yet. My check ride started before I even showed up at the airport. The owner of Horton Aviation, Scott Horton, called me as I was driving to the airport 30 minutes before, informing, informing me that the airplane had issues in the morning and was in maintenance at Long Beach. He said he believes it could be fixed and we should be able to continue the ride as planned and it'll be back before it's time to start flying. This is news after your check ride has already been delayed once that feels like a gut to the gutch punt. <laughs> feels like a punch to the gut, sorry. It's still your job as an applicant to have the proper mindset in which I told myself, you're still going to fly today and I will approach every moment and emotion as if I'm going to fly still. This thought process allowed me to stay focused despite hearing the news. I pulled into ACI FBO on the north end of the airport and the room I had reserved for our check ride had people in it. So I walked over to the restrooms but got stopped short as a male in a button up <laughs> stopped me short and was like, hey, are you Justin? And I was like, ah, this is Taylor. My challenge for the day. We made some small talk as I reversed course, but I talked to the front office about re reserving a room next to the one people were using, but definitely not supposed to have been, and we got settled in conference room two. Taylor DeLay is very professional. You can tell right off the bat he's a very young for a DPE and demands a high level of respect in the way he brings a business-like professional attitude to the table. So if the Riverside Fizdo watches this video, no need to call me, he's got the five stars. He has to see my certificate, medical, and photo ID. He has to see my logbook and all the necessary endorsements for this practical test. The multi-engine doesn't have certain hour and experience requirements, so the process of paperwork was brief. IACRA, despite having a scheduled shutdown an hour, allowed us to proceed. Scott walked in at the perfect time with the aircraft logbooks, and I presented to him what he needed to see. The best part about multi-engine checkride is with the paperwork, there's double to present. I showed him both props, both engines, and the one airframe for required inspections. We closed the book, and it was time to begin the oral. He went through the Privacy Act and the Pilot's Bill of Rights and gave a briefing on how the checkride was going to go. A very thorough briefing which made sure I understood every aspect of the ride and what was expected to be in it and what was expected of me and him. Let's say I have a buddy who needs to get from SNA to San Francisco and he'll pay you to take him up there. So you book the DA-42 for tomorrow. He shows up ready for the flight, but he has a friend that wants to come with as well. Can you do it? I was like, no, you can't. This was the beginning question that Taylor asked about the commercial pilot privileges. I already passed the commercial test, so this was not the main focus of the check ride, as there was only one question about it. Up next, he gave me a situation when I was in cruise and asked which engine was the one that I least wanted to fail and why. I explained that it was the left engine and there are four factors that went into the reasoning. A typical acronym you'd use is PAST. After describing what P-factor, accelerated slipstream, spiraling slipstream, and torque are, he then asked me at what point I would lose directional control and why. I explained everything about VMC, the definition, and how it's induced while flying the airplane. We went into what factors affect VMC, situations or things that lower VMC, and what increases performance. 
I used a table and I will be making a video about that, so stay tuned eventually. This took a good bit of time as there are multiple factors that you have to explain in depth as it's crucial knowledge. The next scenario based conversation was in regards to how I would make decisions with only one engine. For example, when choosing a runway to take off on, what would be the minimum distance I would require to take off and what would I do if I lost an engine? This is when he wanted me to get into departure briefing and also why I choose what I do. That brings up the top of accelerate, stop, go distances and how those come into play for my decision making. A big key in multi-engine flying is knowing what happens when you lose an engine. Not only what to do, but how it affects your performance in every phase of flight. If you lose an engine on takeoff above gear retraction altitude on a hot day at a high altitude airport, consider yourself lucky if your reactions are fast enough to stop the plane from rolling over, and then on top of that, your performance being able to allow you to climb out. Accelerate stop distance is as important as well. For the reason in my training videos we never use two zero left is the same reason you should calculate what your accelerate stop go distance accelerate stop distance is beforehand. Take your take your takeoff ground roll and your landing ground roll and add some margin and there's your accelerate stop distance. I was able to correctly interpret the single engine performance charts and explain what our climb performance would be coming out of John Wayne on that day. It was important to note that you'd fly the aircraft first, then worry about entering right traffic for 2 zero right. Testing my decision making and risk assessment skills were over. It was time to dive into the DA42 systems. When you have a short time to prepare for a check ride in a completely new aircraft, there is a lot of time spent uh, um, in your head in the POH and also researching other resources that will help you digest the new aircraft. Without diving into too much detail, the DA-42 has two diesel engines that are fuel injected with multiple fuel pumps, different types for different jobs. Its ailerons, flaps, and elevator are push rod actuated, trim wheel is connected by a cable. It has a tricycle style landing gear with an elastomer sprung nose wheel to absorb impact, and there's a whole discussion to be had on the operation of the landing gear. The plane has two fuel tanks in each wing, an auxiliary and a main. The auxil auxiliary is never used for training purposes, and due to the weight of the engines, there's a ballast in the back of the plane. Taylor also asks what type of system this plane uses for ice protection and how it works. It's also important to know the service ceiling of the aircraft because of the ability of the multi-engine aircraft to fly higher than you've ever flown before in your training. We went into high altitude regulations and if they apply or not to our aircraft. The DA-42 has a limitation in it that it can't go over to 18,000 feet. I will say that most of the time spent on systems was in uh, the operation of the landing gear and how it worked. The basic questions of systems are expected, but the nuances about the DA-42, about how the oil pressure is maintained and distributed for each system is important to know. After quizzing me on the DA-42 and its systems, he told me I had passed and it was time to go fly. However, we were halted for a solid two hours in between because the ground and flight portion due to waiting for the plane to come back for maintenance. We knew that it was most likely going to come back, so Taylor graciously agreed to stay until it had arrived. And at this point, I was super nervous because it had been four days. We almost got canceled that day too. And then here we are right after the uh, the oral portion and the plane technically wasn't there and we're hoping it was going to come back. So it was a mess either way, but luckily Taylor had agreed to stay. So I was very fortunate for that. The plane itself was just arriving for maintenance as it had, had been having issues all day as previously discussed. One of the flight school instructors hopped out and the line guys came to flip the plane around. I began my pre-flight as Scott, the owner of the flight school, happened to be walking by after a lesson and he struck up a conversation with Taylor as I began my pre-flight. I made sure to be thorough and check the specific area of the plane that had been under maintenance. After this, it was time to hop in and go. Taylor briefed me with what the flight portion was going to consist of and the general plan for our checkride. I then briefed him on all the required items of a good pre-flight briefing, especially when it comes to multi-engine flying. We climbed into the aircraft as I went through the pre-flight flows, making sure to verify using the checklist, and also noting that I indeed had my hood out and ready to go for the single engine ILS. Obtaining a clearance to tax to the midfield run-up from ACI North is quite simple, and taxing went just fine with a proper brake check conducted in the beginning. Looking back on the check ride, I realized that I had rushed a sense of urgency which may have been due to my nerves and the plane barely arriving back home on time. This caused me to also almost miss crucial elements of the flight because instead of breathing, I would try to get through the flows as quick as possible to make it seem like I knew my stuff. Even when it came to reading the checklist, I had a bad habit of skimming over items which I'd mentally mark without completely verifying they were done. But anyways... Running up the engines is very different in the DA-42 compared to most standard general aviation aircraft that people will fly. 
The ECU system and the voter switches make the thought process different as the system will diagnose itself in case of an error while testing the diesel engine system. It was at this phase I declared the runout complete and contacted ground taxi. Before I started taxiing, I realized I didn't put the cross feed for the fuel to go back on, and Taylor after the ride commented when asked, Yeah, I was wondering when you are going to put them back on, as if before takeoff, if you tried to put the fuel pumps on, that wouldn't have been good, because you just can't have that configuration. Main takeaway, no matter how nervous you are, make sure to be thorough with the checklist. With a request for 2-0 right, we taxied 2-0 left and held short. I went through my take pre-takeoff flows and verified with the checklist. We got clearance to go on 2-0 right and began my takeoff roll when lined up with the runway. It is at this moment that D the DPE can understandably be nervous as you increase power and start rolling down the runway at great speeds. There was a slight crosswind which came on as I was rolling down the runway and had to correct for it with the proper inputs. It took me a second as we started to subtly, I'm not talking a lot, just subtly veer to left and I saw Taylor's feet kind of dance toward the pedals but I knew I was in complete control and kind of grinned at it because I was like, ah. Uh, this is, you know, flying with someone new, they get kind of nervous. But anyways, it was fine. Um, <laughs> we made a right 220 departure to begin our set of maneuvers. This was the first VFR check ride I took that I didn't have a built-in cross country at the beginning, so I had an interesting feeling sitting in with a DPE on takeoff and not thinking about navigation points. On our way to the Long Beach practice area, he told me to enter in a slow flight. One big thing about the maneuvers in a multi-engine check ride versus your single-engine commercial is landing gear. Every maneuver has an added step that deals with the landing gear. Slow flight in the dirty configuration is the prescribed condition, and thence it was executed. He told me to turn to a, he told me to turn to a few headings as I climbed and descended, and that was that. He then told me to execute a power off stall. For me personally, I make sure to talk through every maneuver as I'm doing it, as it keeps me on track with what I need to do chronologically. The key in the approach to landing stall is the multi-engine aircraft is in the recovery to procedurally make the correct steps. Flaps, gear, then flaps. Upon completion of the maneuver, I did some more clearing turns to set myself up for the next slew of challenges. He asked me to do a power on stall. Having lots of power in a multi-engine aircraft and a sensitive stall warning horn means that the key to power on, the, the key to doing a power on stall in the clean configuration is to add power, then slowly start to pull back on the stick. The common mistake of pilots flying diamonds performing the power on stall is to increase back stick too quickly and inducing a stall before you actually show a stall while in climb. After talking through this maneuver and promptly recovering from the first indication it was time for the steep turns. Steep turns like my 8s on pylons from my commercial came very naturally to me, and so with the minimal time Scott and I practiced them, I executed them smoothly and minimal altitude change. With this sequence of maneuvers was the completion of standard aerial work. The moment has come on the check ride where you are truly tested if you can handle multi-engine aircraft. Engine out procedures. First thing I needed to demonstrate was the loss of directional control, otherwise known as VMC. This is a good moment for the pilot on their check ride as they're the ones pulling back the power level on, power lever on the left engine when they're expecting it and can adjust accordingly. I picked the point ahead of me facing inland and pulled the power back on that critical engine. I talked my way through the entire maneuver and tried to make the loss of directional control recovery as smooth as possible while recovering power on the good engine. Completing the maneuver is simple as you just need to scissor the power back together and when stabilized announce maneuver complete. Now it was Taylor's turn to pull an engine power as he briefed me as I was about to lose the engine up at cruise altitude. He then pulled the power back on the left engine as I maintained directional control and stopped my foot hard on the right rudder. I powered up on the good engine, identified the dead engine, verified that the engine was dead, and began to secure that engine. In the DA-42 it's fairly more simple than a twin with six levers. Now, the part about cruise is that you have to secure the engine as well and make the propeller feather. Taylor requested that I actually uh, feather the propeller, which I did, and then we began to fly the aircraft around to certain headings and altitudes. After this process was complete, I unfeathered the engine and it was time to go IFR. I went under the hood and Taylor had me fly around with an engine failed to certain headings and altitudes. This was a non-event and the only real thing to trip most people up is knowing which direction the ball swings when the engine fails is equivalent to which rudder to use and which engine is most likely still producing thrust. I have always felt under control when I was under the hood so it wasn't a big deal. I then proceeded under the hood to pick up an approach in Long Beach ILS 3-0. The big deal about approaches under the hood in multi-engine aircraft is that the DPE is going to fail the engine right at the time ATC instructs you to turn onto the approach course. It is the worst spot to have an engine failure because if you focus on flying the plane and not the localizer, you'll bust the check ride, and in real life flying, your safety margin is built into the IFR system. 
It was also just my luck that on this day, ATC really felt like giving me a 70 degree turn on the final, despite my attempts to take a wide angle to better line myself up with the approach path. Just like clockwork, Taylor failed the left engine as I turned onto the approach course. I was going through my engine out flows and at the same time focusing on flying the aircraft. After securing the engine, I got myself stabilized on the approach. All was going well with the localizer center and it was at this point I knew I could only mess up from there. To my pure honesty, it was the worst ILS I've ever shot in a multi-engine aircraft. At one point, I got fixated on the localizer, and the left crosswind got a half-scale deflection on the glide slope. Meanwhile, I was chasing the needles, I almost forgot to do my pre-landing flow, and put the gear down a hair later than I should have. So one could say I was a bit off my game after not flying for four days, despite having gotten good with Scott on shooting the approach approaches towards the end of my training. Like, literally the last two days of my training, we spent on the approaches, because... Uh, it's one of the harder parts of single engine flying is learning how to control the aircraft, also flying the ILS down on a single engine. Um, so, uh, so I was off my game a good bit, and <clears throat> despite being off for four days, uh, I made it work and landed at Long Beach. I say these things to you, and you arm armchair pilots may be judging me. Go ahead. Nobody's perfect. Most days I have awesome flying days where I'm on my stuff and others where I'm not flying well at all. I share my experiences because I want to be a better pilot continually and will continue to grow in my aviation and self-actualization journey, and hopefully you will too. After not so great ILS, I made up for it with some butter on the runway, but anyways, I cleaned up the aircraft and requested taxi to 26 right at Long Beach for some pattern work. We then taxied to the runway where we briefed what was to come. Up first was a short field takeoff into a normal pattern with right traffic. I was just completing the short field takeoff with flaps up at 400 feet and began to enter the crosswind as Taylor failed the left engine. By now my right leg was burning after all these left engine failures and I then went through my quick flow and secured the engine as I made a wide 747 pattern to give myself time under VYSE uh, to get back up to traffic pattern altitude and allowed myself uh, a good descent to land to go much smoother. What most people don't realize at the first part of their training is that an engine out landing is basically a partial power off 180 if you have the skill to fly it that way. When you pull the power on the good engine, the plane flies just like it normally would. Entering final with the right turn on the good engine isn't always easy to get aligned, but nothing a good bit of relaxing on the controls and some rudder can't fix if you need to go left. I finished the landing right on point, right on the point I wanted to land on, and I was preparing for the short field to come. Taxi back to the active. On this next takeoff from 26 right is when Taylor decided to pull the good old you lost an engine on takeoff trick by stomping on the rudder. As I began to roll down the runway, he stomped on the right rudder and I counteracted it with left rudder. He said, good job, let's go. <laughs> um, the sun was starting to go down at this point, so the flight back from Long Beach to John Wayne, despite being short, was quite beautiful and peaceful. Getting the ATIS from the controller and preparing my mind for this last short field landing was crucial. I used my checklist and cruise descent, cruise and descent and entered right traffic for 2 zero right. It was this moment that I decided it was time to shine with my ability to land the aircraft accurately. Putting an aircraft down on the desired spot is always a fun challenge, and this was one I wasn't going to mess up. Feeling the landing gear touch down exactly where I wanted them to be on the touchdown markers made a smile come across my face. It was a smile not coming from pride, but from personal satisfaction that knowing despite going from my commercial to my multi-engine so quick, despite not flying for four days, despite only having 10 hours in this aircraft, despite having a really crappy IFR, uh, <clears throat> I mean a under the hood approach, I had developed the ability to feel an aircraft as it flies and my challenge of the commercial multi-engine rating was almost complete. We held short 2-0 left and then proceeded to taxi back to ACI North where we keep 417 Tango Sierra. I was beyond grateful when Taylor told me I passed and it was time to go do some paperwork. We walked back into ACI lobby and debriefed the check ride. We talked and had a good laugh as I appreciated his professionalism and ability to be firm but easy to talk to. Taylor DeLay is 27 years old as of this check ride review and is making a name for himself in aviation as a very young DPE. If he's listening to this, I hope one day he'll join me for a conversation about his journey through aviation. That's it for my check ride experience. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please let me know in the comment section below. I appreciate all who listened to this, and if there's anything I can do for you guys, let me know. Make sure to like the video and subscribe to support the channel if you found any value with what I'm sharing with you guys. Thank you for all the support. So. You know, off script here, multi-engine flying is a, just a completely different animal when it comes to the single engine maneuvers. Like, take what you know about 
you know, single engine flying and like how the aircraft performs and you have to reorient yourself to think about, okay, I'm flying this, this multi-engine aircraft and I have to control it accurately um, <clears throat> to not, you know, kill yourself. It's, it's a lot more responsibility to take on. Um, overall, great experience with Horton Aviation down in uh, John Wayne. Literally, I got my commercial and my multi-commercial done in three weeks. So that was exciting. It was a lot to do. I was definitely stressed, uh, a little bit more relaxed than uh, when I went into my commercial ride for this check ride. But either way, having the delay of four days, you know, for some people, I'm sure that it was a lot longer for them. And they were like, oh, four days was nothing. But for, for me, four days and only having five lessons, you know, about nine and a half hours of flying total in that aircraft and having to go take a check ride in it, knowing all the systems within a week, it's uh, it was a little bit nerve wracking, but it ended up working out. So uh, once again, guys, support the channel, hit the like, hit the subscribe. As far as Taylor Delay, if you guys click this because you saw the name Taylor Delay and you have a check ride with him, awesome guy. Like I said, 27 years old, super professional. Um, you know, he's gonna be thorough. He's gonna make sure you know your stuff. Some things during the oral, he was like getting in on, and I was like, okay, like he just really wants to see if I know um, some specifics of the aircraft. And so I took that as like, all right, uh, you know, challenge accepted. But um, overall, great guy. Works for American Airlines. He's not easy, and he's not insanely difficult. He's just a harder DPE. Um, whereas other DPEs <coughs> may have me, may give a little bit more lenience, maybe not. So, um, that is the multi-engine check ride from me. Uh, this is all, you know, one take cuts. I want to be as open and honest, less editing, just be a raw type of YouTuber. Um, <coughs> I mean, not even a YouTuber. I just do this one because I think about my kids going to be able to see this one day going through my journey because I hope someday my kids will fly too. And if they don't, they don't. Um, but the point is, is that, you know, I just hope that if you guys get any value out of this, you guys like, subscribe, share it with somebody. Um, and up next is my CFI. I'm going to make a little quick video on what my thoughts are at this stage of my training. So uh, thanks, guys. JPL Aviation is where leadership and aviation take off.